going to just preface my talk with um, just a few things about, I guess, ultimately, the condition of today, because that's, um, as a painter, the condition of today is kind of the point I'm working through and from. Um, so in thinking about the conference title, you've got these ideas of materialization and dematerialization, and they have a real particular consequence for object-based object forms of culture, such as painting, um, both in terms of how we create and how we consume it. So, you know, in the, thrust, in the past three decades, there's been this real sea change um, through the advent of computer digital culture and the internet, and this has meant that more culture is being produced and presented primarily in dematerialized form. Um, so even in an object-based um, pursuit such as painting, we are more likely or increasingly more likely to consume it in an everyday sense as dematerialized form and not as object um, firsthand. So I'm going to give this presentation in three parts. Um, the first being a childhood anecdote as to my beginnings as a cultural consumer and creator um, within a program called Hypercard, if anyone's familiar with that, um, which serves as a kind of metaphor for the modern day internet. Um, the second being an exam examples of the contemporary consumption of painting in materialized form, um, so basically how we consume painting now. And the third being a study on one of my paintings in the conference exhibition called Double Lux Number One. Um, so the title of my talk is Stacks, and this could have been replaced with any number of more precise iterations, I, I suspect. Um, but the term does serve as kind of a loose connector between um, all three points of the discussion. So in computer science, a stack is a kind of a particular kind of collection in which the principal operations are the addition of an entity to the collection known as push and the removal of an entity known as pop. A stack may be implemented to have a bounded capacity. If the stack is full and does not contain enough space to accept an entity to be pushed, the stack is then considered to be in an overflow state. And if you've ever been on a computer and got the error, um, stack overflow. That's kind of what's happening. So to borrow from this computer science terminology, I see the function of a stack as applicable to contemporary painting process, wherein painting is increasingly taking the form of both material artifact and a material metadata of digital transformations and transactions. The process of painting is always bound by the push and the pop, the adding and removing that occurs in a stack. If we see stacks as sets of layers akin to the layers in painting, then we can see how a painting can be made by the addition, erasure, and rearranging of these stacks. So one of my first encounters with the term stack was a pr as a primary school student in the 1980s. Um, Hypercard was created by software programmer Bill Atkinson in 1987 and released by Apple as free software on the Apple Macintosh, um, subsequently, uh, sub subsequently becoming po extremely popular in schools and universities. Um, Hypercard was supposed to offer a new media-based way of programming, a kind of everyman application builder resembling the physical stacking of information cards. My own use of Hypercard uh, in the light, late 1980s represented an early experience of media that was similar to how we now use the modern day internet. Hypercard was based on the idea of creating stacks. Each stack could contain a variety of textual, audiovisual, and graphical elements. Navigation elements, elements could be added and used as a standard graphical interface. Users could interface through the stacks with scrolling windows and hyperlinks that jump to content that was contained in another, in, another, in another stack. The look of the various kind of stacks created in Hypercard varied greatly due to its varied uses as gaming system, educational tool, or as a more esoteric tool of creation. Um, as Terry Winograd surmises, it is impossible to show a typical hypercard screen since hypercard's facilities to draw artwork onto cards have been used to produce every look imaginable. Interestingly, we could say the same about different implementations of historical and contemporary website creation, which seem infinitely varied, albeit trapped within certain protocols. Uh, visually, hypercard allowed users to think in a non-linear way about the construction of text and media. My own experience of Hypercard was in hours spent playing the, the Hypercard authored game, Where in the World is Carmen Sandiego? 
as well as creating my own stacks, incorporating default images and sounds from Apple with my own text and graphical elements. Technically, these were conventional stack files, but one could also view them as experiments in drawing and hypermedia. Indeed, these were creative precedents in the use of hypercard for artistic purpose, predominantly in the form of hypertext poetry by writers such as William Dickey. Uh, Hypercard was an early example of a tool used for the, both the creation and consumption of hypertext and hypermedia. So these are just some images of what it looked like. Um, so jumping forth into the present, the contemporary internet distills visual information into a certain set of parameters. Those parameters are linked to the technological confines of the internet and those devices that were used to navigate its contents. A painting on the internet is compressed by necessity, rasterized as a digital file, and more often than not presented as a 72 DPI JPEG or PNG file. Through this means of presentation, lost is the initial scale of the work and any concept of surface or materiality. These properties can only be assumed or imagined. The ability to zoom further into the image serves to provide more detail only when the original content is at a high enough quality. More often than not, the input of control plus or similar zoom function will result in a digital marsh of blurry pixelation. The surface and physicality of the original painting long lost in translation. Uh, social sharing, sharing sites such as Tumblr, Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, and the art-specific art stack all allow fast and global uh, ways of communicating images. Paintings are shared as visual sound bites, appearing on the feeds of users connected through these social networks. As an article on Time Magazine Online describes, users can drag an add to stack button on the top of their browsers so that they can add photos while surfing the web or to snap pictures while gallery hopping. Add art stack allows users to organize stacked art into collections. In addition, sites such as Contemporary Art Daily operate in a predominantly visual context, graduating from a blog and taking the place of the physical art, art magazine, but without much of the associated written content, like an ad-only version of Art Forum, although this may in itself sound like a bit of a paradox. Contemporary Art Daily thus, thus acts as a key site for sharing through social feeds, supplying a frequently updated and curated collection of art of the moment. A quick scroll through of images is spectacular in distilling aesthetic content into such an economical form, but fleeting in memorability due to the heightened speed of distribution and consumption. To view a medium such as painting through these means carries the same problems as to view any painting through its digital image. Material materiality is expunged and aesthetic is enhanced. Artist and writer Adi Bergkant takes this point further writing and still photos are usually an idealized version of the pieces that make them look closer to how the artist intended them to look. The problem with that is really, it's so much easier and for the most part makes so much more sense now just to Photoshop or 3D sculpt how you want your work to look, rather than ever printing it or painting it or assembling it. Although, that, although this consuming experience therefore alienates us from understanding the physical materiality of a painting, it is precisely this misunderstanding that can carry over as an intriguing impetus for the creation of painting. Painting now more than ever exists simultaneously as material object and dematerialized image. So if this is how we now consume painting, how do we go about materializing or rematerializing painting in practice? So I'm just gonna jump out of um, PowerPoint for a moment and just to allude to one of the things I was talking about. So instead of viewing this work in PowerPoint, we'll view it through ArtStack, which is one of those um, network, uh, networks of distribution that I was talking about. Um, so this painting is Double Lux number one. Uh, I begin with a Google search, collecting images that appear in relation to a series of keywords. 3D texture, generated texture, silver, gold, rock, sand, silk, and metal. From these images, I import a selection into the software program Coral Draw, arranging and grouping them into sets, and then reducing the number of images by deleting the ones that I find the least interesting. The reason for which is not exactly clear, other than to say I'm looking for images that might appear to be able to refer both to their virtual or associated materiality, and to a sense of something painterly. At the end of this process, each set contains just a few images. Within one set, there are a series of images that relate to gold. 
I open these images in Photoshop and apply transformations on each, cropping, scaling, tiling, and rotating until a common size is reached, equal to a standardized 14 by 11 inch frame. Multiple variations on these transformations are saved. For double lux number one, the resulting image is kept close to the found source image. Digital transformations have occurred and the image has been rotated, tiled, and smudged. I will call this the background layer. On top of the background layer, I create a new layer and select the spray paint brush tool. I set the fill color to white. I draw a continuous spray painted gesture that traverses over the entire image. After several attempts, I have a version that I'm happy with. I save this layer, I trace its outer paths, and I export a matching Adobe Illustrator file. Using a vinyl cutter, I cut these paths into a sheet of painter's mask. I open up a new file, an image of a selection of cotton duck canvas that I scanned long ago, and that I continuously reuse in my paintings. I make a new image of this that is five centimeters larger on each side in the background layer. I copy, the tile enough, I copy and tile enough of these canvas images to fit. The image is tiled at a one-to-one -one scale to the original canvas scan. I open up the original background layer. I copy the background layer and paste it into a new layer on top of the new canvas image. I flatten the image and save it as a TIFF file at a resolution of 350 DPI. I send this to the printer and I collect a high quality printed version on canvas substrate. I, st I stretch this print into stretcher bars. The front side contains the gold background layer and the sides contain the tiled canvas image. I take the stretch canvas to a spray booth and I buy, apply a clear layer of acrylic polymer. After this is dry, I load my spray gun with a series of colors that closely matches the palette of the original image. I also select a spray gun that matches the scale of the Photoshop spray tool relative to this now materialized object. I spray freehand transparent glazes and opaque applications of color. When this is dry, I attach the painter's mask, which contains a negative image of the Photoshop spray paint file. Once this is adhered, I load my spray gun with white acrylic paint and I begin to spray, following the mask, retracing the action of the original Photoshop spray painted gesture. Alongside this process, I've prepared a series of sculpted painted forms. I'm doing so using an acrylic medium with a high content of marble that precisely retains form in the sculpted material. Some of these are scanned and digitally transformed for use in other paintings, while some become material components in the final painting object. I select one of these painted artifacts that closely maps out some of the imagery within the stretch painting that already prepared. I use the same color palette as prepared earlier and spray paint the chosen painted artifact in these colors, building up a rich surface of paint. In parts of the object, the direction of the spray paint maps out and emphasizes the sculpted form. Finally, I apply white highlights that correlate to the areas on the painting surface where the white spray painted gesture sits, visually connecting the artifact of the, of, on the, Im of the image on the canvas surface. Finally, I adhere the painted artifact to the stretch canvas paint. So obviously that was a very dry step-by-step -step, um, go through of how I make this painting and that was to serve just to show um, the translations, the transformations and the transactions that happen between all those materials and, and applications of process. So this painting is double lux number one. Here, double lux number one takes the form of contemporary palimpsest. Layers of image and process are overridden to one another. The painting is a stack of gestures or actions, some perceivable as material remnant, some unperceivable as dematerialized act. I will, therefore, I will conclude by citing the technologist Ted Nelson, whom in 1965 coined the, t the aforementioned terms hypertext and hypermedia, and later the internet. Um, Nelson defined hypertext as meaning a body of written or pictorial material interconnected in such a complex way that it could not be conveniently, not conveniently be presented or represented on painter, uh, on paper. Um, to be a painter now is to work in the opposite direction. To paint is to attempt to rematerialize the world and hand back into a painting object. In doing so, we could adjust Nelson's quote to instead propose painting as being the following, which is up here. Painting is a body of painted material and image interconnected in such a complex way that it could not conveniently be presented or represented through hypermedia. Thank you.